Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could teach the gullible to never be so comfortable with eyes they eat like comfort food? To disregard the bogus claims of pseudoscientific claims, can you imagine just how much indeed the world would change? No more political predators playing on the populace with ilkus and plots to shift and kill metropolis. No more villains with the title in the Bible holding phony temper rivals like the stuff they teach is vital. Imagine it was normal to have to prove a claim you If folks really feel ashamed of pressing content that was fake, it's not to say we never make mistakes, it's just to say we go out of our way to show the evidence it takes. Remain skeptical while you travel the world or even stay strapped. We're allowed to get fast, that's what it is, yo. Any yeah. reality is that health and truth, uh-huh. bro. Question every claim, especially the ones you believe in. Remain skeptical while you travel the world or reason. Hey, welcome to, uh, um, welcome. I, I, I got this, I got this. Uh, welcome to the award-winning show, uh, Road to Reason, uh, Skeptic's Guide to the 21st Century. Uh, I'm David Tamayo, President of Hispanic American Freethinkers, and today I have the pleasure and honor uh, to be with Dr. Robert Pensack. What, what, what's wrong? What's the matter, man? I can't do that. I don't think I can do this. I, what, I, what? I, I, I'm not, my head's not clear. It's a big show. I'm just, I'm not, feel like I'm thinking. Just give me a minute. Okay. <laughs> Well, that's so much better. Hey, everyone, I'm Rob Penzak. Welcome to Rose to Reason. I'm happy to be here. We have a whoa, fantastic whoa, wait, show. Wait, 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 wait. What's, what, what? what's going on? What, what, what is show this? To, show to do, man. What, 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 is that in your, what is that in your head? What, 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 what were you doing? I, I was just kind of fixing, you know, I need my brain juices to get flowing, and so I, you know, I, I went with the, and, the, su- and this, the vacuum suction cupping method, you, you know, the brain cupping. What, what's that called? It's brain cupping. Don't you do this? Bra- no, brain cupping. Yeah. If Where did you, you get that, that idea from? <laughs> it's what you got to run with. All the leading experts are advocating it now, that if you hit a time period where you just can't think, the thoughts won't come to you, you just, you stick the vacuum on your head, and it, it sucks the toxins out, and it just, it works. I mean, I'm back. Whoa, I'm ready to roll. But, but how, how does that how does that work? It, it works fantastic. No, Thanks for asking. No, I mean, okay, it is. never mind, never mind. Let's get, get that thing out of the head and let's let's talk seriously about all right. cupping. All right. Let's talk about this cupping thing. All right. So, what is this what is this cupping all about? Well, it, unfortunately, it's going to become the new rage because you know Michael Phelps, an extremely talented swimmer, um, along with the rest of the team, I think the men's gymnastic team, they're all using cupping as if it's actually a scientifically uh, useful but procedure. Let's talk about so you have medical background, a lot of education. What is cupping exactly? What's it, how do you describe that? What well, we do didn't, do? We didn't do? actually study a great deal of cupping in the actual medical community, which is funny. Although I will mention one report later where, um, uh, well, I'll say it now. So a burn center, after looking into this cupping, was saying one of the solutions, you, know, you take a, a cup and you can heat it up, um, and then as it cools and the molecules uh, lose their heat and contract back down, it, it creates a negative pressure, so you have a vacuum. Sucks and so this it. sucks the, the blood out, you get a little extravasated blood, which is what those hickeys look like, or all those dark marks on them. Um, so they, they, in this uh, little medical thing at a burn center, it mentions that the proper way to avoid people getting burns is that we need to train medical personnel better on the proper use of this technique instead of saying, hey, this isn't a medical technique. So um, the, the, this is the thing. There's no no evidence that this works, does, is there? And no, and there's no theory behind it that would make any kind of sense. You know the argument we're going to hear? The argument we're going to hear is, well, look, he won well, 12 medals or he, something. He did do great. Obviously, it works. Yeah. No one would notice that he didn't do any of this before, and he still won a whole 12 medals before, before doing this cupping thing. Right, and, and then the media, we have such a high level of scientific illiteracy, and, you know, there's they're just there to echo, hey, somebody did this or somebody said this, instead of just think of the difference it would have been with you know tens or hundreds of million people watching. They said, by the way, this doesn't work. This is bogus medicine. It has no theory behind it. It's not effective. Don't do this. It's almost by, defi- by, by definition, it's pseudoscience. That's absolutely. It, it pretends to do something. It looks like it does something. It, typically, what I think it does is it separates gullible people from their money. <laughs> you know? But the problem with this, and, and a lot of people have asked me, well, if what harm Harm could it do? And the problem is that it creates uh, faulty thinking. It creates that alternative medicine is good. You know, it's supposed to be an ancient Chinese right. thing. I didn't see a single Chinese uh, <laughs> people, and they did. Put, China's done pretty good, but you know, next to the U.S. is, is you know they've done, right. and not, not one single Chinese uh, athlete had cupping done anywhere. Right, and just the notion that because something is ancient and pre-scientific, that makes it all the more powerful. You know, it's ridiculous. We need to sort of get but that thought out. I still think out. a lot of uh, 
uh, so the problem is a lot of young people are going to be doing this and, and, and but I think it might have a positive thing and that is you know when when you come home and your girlfriend sees a hickey on you right. you can just say hey it's just a couple uh, I mean, I'm in training it. I'm in training <laughs> right <laughs> now so, um, oh this yeah. is it's, it's really silly I mean it, it, if, if abuse I assume if you leave something in there sucking in there for hours and hours it can probably cause damage to, to your well, skin yeah, I mean I guess it would depend how strong that negative vacuum is but yeah. separately if you heat it up so one of those articles you know it's from a burn center so they're saying how we have to learn the technique better but yeah so if you heat glass up and it's on your skin wherever it can cause burns right. plus the whole idea that we're promoting non-scientific based there's no evidence for it yeah um, Not, and the, the other problem of course is if it's done in the wrong place if cupping is done in a ear an eye or sure. you know some right where you can area hurt, that hurt the organ yeah. yeah and then we've seen like with the whole anti-vax movement that you put Michael Phelps out there he is now the poster child for this and you look at you know Jenny McCarthy um, Jim Carrey and how much damage they did by convincing all these non-scientifically based people hey there's something to this anti-vaccination and he, I saw I've, I've seen at least three or four American uh, athletes that had cupping done and of course uh, I think uh, Patroth uh, Gwyneth Paltrow also uh -huh. she does the, the, the cupping thing uh, as a fashion statement you see it in, I've seen pictures of her back uh -huh. in, in uh, so uh, well I think we're gonna see a lot more of this yeah, before so, so, so we should move on to the story um, but if anybody wants to contribute to this amazing new advanced suction super therapy uh, and ask and we're happy to take your contributions right here I'm pretty sure Robin Dawkins of the uh, CFI is gonna get behind us and support this so we'll check that in a minute um, what was the other story you want to go over so I, I, want, I want to talk about a story that we have and that is uh, the uh, the, the uh, 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 let me read it. The Pew Research Center uh, a couple of days ago came out with a study that shows that children throughout uh, the country, in every state, uh, they are they have laws that they're protecting uh, children. But every place, uh, well, not every, 34 states plus Guam, Puerto Rico, and and uh, D.C. have laws that actually that are based on religion. And so, if one of these protective laws violate religious rights mm -hmm. then the religion gets the privilege and uh, and this can be very harmful in some states for instance their religious exemption even for criminal child abuse and neglect and uh, throughout over the past 10 years that I've been keeping an eye on this it doesn't seem to get let up the Christian science is, is probably the biggest one they don't have they don't allow uh, people to or they encourage people not to go to the doctor we've had people kids that have died of diabetes and we also have uh, at least a uh, uh, some states, six states, mm -hmm. that even uh, criminal manslaughter, uh, if there's religion attached to it uh, and a child involved, then the, the religion takes the, the precedent. So it's really right. sickening because this is the 21st century. Yeah. Jehovah Witnesses are not allowed to do blood transfusions, mm -hmm. even to save the life of a child. And so the problem with, with the child, and the reason we're concentrating on the child, is that children depend on adults. They can't, they don't have, they, they don't have the authority to seek treatment themselves and they depend on adults. And so the, if the adults believe in this uh, imaginary Magic. things, then you know the children are getting harmed and it's something that I think we, we should work to, towards getting laws changed in every state. Yeah, you know, it's funny how much religion cares about the zygote, you know, the, <laughs> but they don't care so much about the person one, once they're alive. Really, and yeah. and where, where are the child's rights uh, to be protected and grow to adulthood being healthy? Um, Sean Faircloth talks about some of the points that you made um, in Attack of the Theocrats, where, you know, like if you have a daycare center that's religious, they don't get the same examination, they don't have the same rules, and if they leave a kid in the van and they bake and they die. Has it happened? You know, it happens and they just move on and it's, you know, the, it's the, there are real lives that are being cost, you know, because of our, our failure to uh, apply the same rules to everybody and let religion have their exemptions. Yeah. So, so what announcements do we have? Because um, I'm really we, eager to get to our... Yeah, we're, we're going to run through these quickly because we want to get Robin on here. Um, I want to say uh, we have a couple of Save by Science shows coming up. We had a, an excellent one just this last week with David Tamayo, Mandy Thomas, yeah. uh, Candace Gorham, uh, Sylvia Lynch, and Jason Callahan and Tiffany Green uh, helped moderate that about sort of the special challenges that people in the black and, and um, Hispanic communities face when trying to leave religion behind. Mm -hmm. um, all of these programs that we do down there, as soon as I can catch my breath, will uh, get posted uh, for free. You know, on the are, internet, you so are you I reading can, my mind without my permission again? Um, you know, <laughs> you know, I was going to say the man, the man upstairs is helping me out. Yeah. When are those coming out? Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it was a really an amazing talk, and I think everyone that was participated in this forum uh, was really glad to be able to express a lot of the things that we go through uh, in the different communities in order to help.
help secularize and, and avoid some of the things that we're just talking about. Mm -hmm. so, so thank you for yeah, no, thank you there. For, so on, on October 2nd, for anybody that is in the Richmond area, we're going to be having something on Dream On. Uh, this is going to be with political satirist John Fugelsang and Emmy Award winning and Academy Award nominated producer Roger Weisberg are going to join us remotely. Um, this is a documentary, uh, Dream On, that retraces Alexis de Tocqueville's steps when he first came to America and thought it was so egalitarian in the land of opportunity and see is the American dream still alive uh, or is it not doing so well. Yeah, And uh, all of these things that we're talking about, of course, there's no charge. It's, it's, it's mostly, it's all of it to educate people that want to be educated on different topics. Right. Um, and uh, then also, I'll just mention one other is on November 6th that uh, Gavin Schmidt, who's the director of NASA Goddard Space Institute, is going to do a talk with us on climate change. So we're really excited. Um, and so why is, he, is he coming to prove that climate change doesn't exist? It turns out it doesn't exist. We were, us skeptics were wrong all along. No, so you know that's really important. This is going to affect future generations. And you know, so part with part of critical thinking is to let science kind of take a lead role in these yeah. things. Well, uh, one of the things that I don't see enough in uh, in the public in the political sphere in in, in this era of elections is I like to see the candidates come in and sit down and do a debate on science, on science questions only, and, and have them do that. I know there are groups that have, been tried, have tried to do this for a very long time and haven't succeeded because the candidates are not stupid. They, they don't want to talk about these things. Mm -hmm. They don't want to show that basically they're you know, to the highest seller and, uh, or, and or their ignorance about topics, you know, it force them to learn something about science. Right, crucial topics for the future. Yeah. Um, just move on. So Labor Day weekend, what do you do and what should everybody may be thinking about if they're interested. Well, uh, Dragon Con. It's where is the place to be. It's going to be a, a, a great, uh, how many? 60, well, last year they had 60,000 people. 60, I um, can't even imagine yeah. that many people there. Right. And you know, it's science, people that love science, that sci love science fiction, mm -hmm. and there's a track uh, for for uh, skepticism. Right, so we have a skeptic track run by our secular person of the week, Derek uh, Colangino, who runs the Skepticality podcast for Michael Shermer Skeptic Society, also yes. runs the skeptic track for Dragon Con, has been incredibly helpful um, with Atheist and he's amazing. He's in. really amazing. And uh, so I hope that you join us over there. We're going to be there. We'd yeah. love to talk to you and meet you over there, and and you know be part of the of this skeptic track over there to talk about uh, skeptical things. Yeah, we're going to talk straight epistemology. You'll have a chance to see us in person. To Aaron Ra is going to be there talking. Mark Gura is going to be there talking. Yes. Uh, Phil Torres is joining us, and John Loftus. So it should be a fantastic time. Why don't we jump to the uh, jokes, and then we will. All right. Out. So I have a joke, uh, and you tell me if it's funny or not. All right. I'm going to read it because I don't want to screw it up. Right. And you know, these are, we always do religious jokes because, you know, we don't respect ideas. Ideas have to stand on their own. So, uh, how does every Islamic joke start? How? By looking over its shoulder. Uh, so, okay. Is that okay. funny? Not enough. We need one more and then we cut to break. All right. So, here's one. Maybe this is a little funny. Also, in the same slant. Uh, what is the difference between a Protestant woman and a Muslim woman? What? Well, a Protestant woman gets stoned before they commit adultery. And on that, we will be right back. That's all Smokey wants for his 70th birthday. Thank you, dear. Well, you're very supple. It's like I was at your age. Back then, I was a sex expert. Used to call me the buttered biscuit. I know about birth control, too. So, you can ask me anything, baby. Bedsider.org has birth control information and a lot more. And it's... Have you had sex in this car yet? This is Richard Dawkins. Doing commercials is unfamiliar territory for me, but I'm inviting you to watch Road to Reason, a skeptic's guide to the 21st century, on Fairfax Public Access every Sunday. Each week the hosts tackle wishful thinking, religion, pseudoscience and the harm they cause with a combination of facts, humour and community involvement. They challenge believers to defend their faith and give you, the skeptic, a voice. With live call-ins for viewers and streaming on the World Wide Web, there's never a dull moment. Don't wait. Look at them now on Facebook and YouTube 
and remember to watch Road to Reason, a skeptic's guide to the 21st century, or there'll be hell to pay. Looks like it's done. Don't let salmonella get funky with your chicken. On average, one in six Americans will get a foodborne illness this year. You can't see these microbes, but they might be there. So learn the right temperature to cook each type of meat. Keep your family safe at foodsafety.gov. A critical thinker is in a frame of mind of always questioning everything, including things they don't necessarily want to question. You may have done some research and satisfied yourself on a position you're sure is right. Good. Now, after a month or two of that, go look at some research that opposes your point of view or challenges the position you've taken. You can even look into it with the idea of poking holes in their arguments if you want, but it would be better to just have an open mind and read it as though you'd never heard or seen anything on the issue before. You may be very surprised what you learn, and if you're doing this right, you will be. Always be open to opposing points of view and counter arguments. That's what critical thinking is all about. And now you know. All right, welcome back to Road to Reason, a skeptic's guide to the 21st century. David, you want to introduce yes, our guest? Yes, so today we have the pleasure, the honor of having Robin Blumner. Did I say it right? Blumner. Blumner. I always blame my Spanish accent every time I say something wrong. It actually <laughs> sounds better when you say it. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to read this because I don't want to screw it up, but basically, just so our audience knows a little bit about you, you graduated from Cornell University in 1982. Uh, you so now you know my age. Yeah. <laughs> well, you were a prodigy child at 10 and uh, graduated from uh, New York University School of Law uh, around 1985 all this is on the internet so you know uh, and then you worked as a labor negotiator uh, for a branch of the New York uh, City Transit Authority uh, right for a while I did and you volunteered for the American Civil Liberties Union uh, Reproductive Freedom Project in New York uh, and also uh, you then moved to Salt Lake City and lived uh, among the Mormons uh, and became executive director of the ACLU of Utah. So that's uh, also very interesting. I, can I call ask that you. my Peace Corps experience. <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> and also, and, and the two things that I that just kind of, you were nominated to, for a Pulitzer Prize before, and uh, I was a finalist. Finalist, yes. And you were, and you met Nelson Mandela. Oh, that was uh, incredible. So you know, these the Kevin Bacon degrees of things. So <laughs> I'm kind of glad I'm next to you. And that, like, oh, it's almost like a, like I'm almost there with him. So welcome, and, and thank you. For, for being here with us. Uh, a couple of things. Do, before we go on, do you have any announcements uh, or anything? I do, because you know I saw that Richard Dawkins was in the uh, public service announcements promoting Road to Reason, and uh, he will be at the SciCon convention in Las Vegas, October 26th through the 30th. He'll be speaking. Uh, this is an, a, a huge skeptics conference. It, and it will include James Randi as well. Oh. I mean, some of the most preeminent skeptics yeah. in the country will be there. It's sponsored by the Center for Inquiry and the Committee for Skeptical Inquirer, which puts out um, Skeptical Inquirer magazine. I subscribe. Oh, mm -hmm. very good, mm -hmm. excellent, thank you. And it should be an incredible time. It's gonna be at the Excalibur Hotel and there will be jousts. Yes, <laughs> I've been to that hotel, it's beautiful. <laughs> Looks like this beautiful castle from outside. So if you wanna see how Richard Dawkins is doing, I, um, some of your uh, watchers may know he had a stroke in February and he's come back from it incredibly well. Yes, he's fantastic now. He's doing public speaking again. Yes. And so if you'd like to see him in person, come to SciCon. Yes. And I believe he's going to be in November uh, in uh, Canada with uh, uh, at a convention there also. In Vancouver, yes. In Vancouver, yes. I was trying to think of the city. Yes, in Vancouver. Uh, uh, so hopefully uh, our folks in that side of the country can, uh, can see him there. Uh, so what do you think of uh, Rob's uh, Anas? <laughs> yeah, I think that the uh, the cupping scandal at the Olympics is uh, one of the, the worst aspects of what had been a, a fairly a, exciting it, game. The problem is they, they're using all these athletes to show that they it works. They are, and I know? think they've got a lot of converts as a result. Um, the 
the Center for Inquiry has a significant program attacking pseudoscience and we put out a press release recently just denouncing cupping and the athletes that are promoting it as you know quackery yeah some some uh, some athletes said that uh, that oh it's not me it's it's the, it's the trainer the trainers the yeah. trainers uh, so. well you know some some pseudoscience is not particularly harmful uh, this is harmful yeah. and it, it's dangerous people uh, get burned as a result infections can occur and anyone who follows the the lead of these athletes in that direction will do so at the deficit of their health um, but it, it also teaches bad thinking and you so see if I had some interesting things going on with homeopathy is that right Lance? it does yeah so another pseudoscientific remedy is uh, homeopathy and that's called the water cure mm -hmm. uh, basically the idea is that water has some kind of memory power and if you put a, a, a little bit of a disease into it that in the same way that vaccines are supposed to work but of course vaccines are evidence-based mm -hmm. and are effective um, if you dilute water enough so that the whatever the active ingredient ingredient is no longer harmful so supposedly it will have remedial effects and it turns out that they dilute these solutions to such a degree that, it, that there are no active ingredients. At the end, you're basically taking water or, sh or the sugar that surrounds the water. Um, if I can jump in for just a second, Dave and I are marketing this for 1999. We've actually gone past that. We diluted out the water so much that there's actually no water <laughs> molecules left either. And, and so, we, uh, we sh uh, we're going to tell you about this other business that we may want the CF CFI <laughs> to be uh, included in this business. It's a way to raise funds and everything is, is to create cupping in the shape of the logo of CFI. Ah, the meatball, as we call it, the CFI meatball. Well, look, homeopathy is total fraud. It is selling water to people who don't know any better, and it's a $3 billion business in the United States every year. We have to... Which, uh, which means, to me, that what I hear is they probably have a lobbying group, which means they're not going to want Congress or, or any lawmakers to make any laws against it. So what CFI has done is submit uh, comments to the Food and Drug Administration and the Federal Trade Commission to say, you know, it's up to federal agencies to start policing these practices, especially the Federal Trade Commission. The way homeopathy uh, remedies mm -hmm. are marketed suggests that they are effective, and of course they're not. So it's a huge consumer fraud problem. And not only have has CFI submitted various comments to federal agencies demanding that they do their job, which is protect consumers from this kind of fraud, but uh, we're looking to uh, engage in litigation down the road. Mm -hmm. uh, we think that the way homeopathy products are sold or marketed is fraudulent and uh, there's no reason why the legal system can't address it. Oh, the, the sad thing is it's in every pharmacy. You it's in pharmacy and it's, it's, and it's often mixed up with uh, evidence-based medicine. Mm -hmm. And of course since they're selling water it's a lot cheaper. People think, <laughs> oh margins. well, homeopathy, it must be, <laughs> an, so, or it must, it must be uh, based on some kind of evidence, they're selling it in a legitimate pharmacy, they're putting it intermixed with evidence-based medicine, it's cheaper. This probably is just the natural cure as opposed to the, whatever, the chemical. Uh, unnatural. The unnatural, the pharmaceutical cure. I'll go with the natural. They don't know that all they're doing is giving, getting themselves uh, a box of nothing. Right, well, they're, they're working acupuncture into hospitals now. You know, it's a profit center. So you have all these places that are paying for money or that their corporate agenda is to make money and so as long as they it's in their interest not to sort of notice that it's bogus and now they have these extra millions coming in per year you know the vitamin industry is multi-billion dollar you look at all these things and then, then we have the NIH with its alternative medicine wing. Mm -hmm. What is a poor average consumer without a medical background to do? Um, so I think it's, you know, it's fantastic that CFI is really taking an active lead role in trying to and counter and this. There, there's one other, uh, and I'm going to mention another group, another website that I like, uh, whatstheharm.net. It's a good place to get to find a look at actual cases of people getting hurt by these 
quackery uh, all over the place. And uh, it's your job. Uh, you know, if you think you're, this is this is uh, also uh, quackery, you need to tell others, your relatives, your family, and and not uh, let them just do buy the stuff and think, well, they're not getting it, they're not hurting. So you know, you think it's not hurting someone. For instance, if you're just taking a water pill, I mean, really, what what harm could it do? But it prevents you from actually addressing uh, your symptoms, whatever they may be, with with medicine that might actually cure you. Yeah. Uh, often these are cold remedies or sore throat remedies. These are are afflictions that will take care of themselves over time, so people think, well, maybe it was effective. <laughs> that, that helps the, the, the efficacy of the uh, placebo when, <laughs> when it gets better on its own. Right, exactly. Um, so we're going to spend most of the show talking about kind of CFI, the Dawkins Foundation, where you see that going. Um, as David pointed out, you, you have a wonderful background of kind of progressive activism. I'd love you to spend just a few minutes talking about that and how everything you did in the past sort of ties into where you are now, and, and how excited are you to be running CFI? I, I am so excited. It's an incredible organization. It was founded by Paul Kurtz. Uh, dozens of years ago, and uh, it is the preeminent science, uh, scientific skepticism and secularism organization. Uh, and it's a perfect melding with, with bringing the Richard Dawkins Foundation into CFI. It's the perfect melding of two organizations whose mission is reason, science, and secular values. Uh, and I'm, I'm very lucky, lucky to have landed where I have. With, uh, so with I'm going to ask the, the impertinent question. <laughs> Whose idea was this? I mean, it seems like it's a good idea. Whose idea was it to bring the two or two very well respected and large organizations uh, to in under one roof? And will they continue to be two separate organizations, or eventually just be one? Uh, I'll answer your last question first. Okay. Uh, we are formally merging, legally merging, so that the Richard Dawkins Foundation will become a division of the Center for Inquiry. It will maintain its singularity, its uh, branding, its identity, its programs, but it will for intents and purposes be a subpart of the Center for Inquiry. And that will help in in terms of economies of, of scale, which is really why uh, this merger makes perfect sense, you know? You want to put as much money into programming and into the work and activism as you possibly can, and not spend so much on, on right. fundraising, administration, phones, external uh, auditors, is. phones, you know, all the, the, the essential elements of mm -hmm. running a, a large and sophisticated operation. So by bringing those the organizations together, really we get we get rid of a lot of redundancy. So we, okay, so you, what I heard, uh, it's your idea. Uh, it was my <laughs> idea. Oh, please let me disabuse you of that right now. Okay. So uh, what happened was, in fact, uh, early a year ago, um, Ron Lindsay, who was CEO of the Center for Inquiry, approached the Richard Dawkins Foundation with the idea that he thought our missions were so closely aligned, the work we were doing was really a mirror image of, of each other. Why not? join forces in a formal way. At the same time, Ron was announcing that he was he was stepping down, that he was retiring. Um, he'd spent a goodly number of years with the Center for Inquiry, first as its general counsel and then as its president and CEO, and it was time. He wanted to do other things, including write. And so it seemed like the perfect opportunity. They were looking for a new leader. The, the missions were, were the same, and uh, as long as I came along, it's, it worked. Uh, they did, uh, CFI did a nationwide search for a new CEO, and uh, they decided, and, and they decided <laughs> the, the person they wanted was right in their backyard, and bringing a, an organization with it. So, so yeah. yeah, so I still wanted to jump back to the personal side, like the activism that you used to do, how does that, how does that fit into what you're doing now? Like, do you have a platform to do your humanist things that you've always wanted to? Absolutely. One of the things is Richard Dawkins Foundation uh, didn't have that CFI does is a, a affirmative humanist agenda, you know, to uh, to advance the cause of of ethical humanism, um, and I, and CFI does that in all sorts of ways. I mean, I think the thing that though that CFI has that the Dawkins Foundation did not that is perhaps the most important element is in this international piece. So CFI has an Office of Public Policy headed by Michael Dodora, 
and we sit on the UN Human Rights Council. We have a formal seat on the Hu UN Human Rights Council and get to speak about the protection of secular people around the world. So well, that, that shouldn't be a problem with Saudi Arabia being <laughs> at the head of uh, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we we uh, are finally giving voice to the secular bloggers in Bangladesh who are subjected to slaughter uh, right now. We're giving voice to people who um, who are being charged with blasphemy around the world because they're an atheist and they're speaking out about it. Uh, there wasn't really that um, at advocacy on the world stage before CFI stepped into it. And it's very exciting and I think it really is, a, is an add-on for the work of the Richard Dawkins Foundation. And it means that the reach is really international. Now, of course, Richard Dawkins is an international star. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the ways the, that the Richard Dawkins Foundation was making sure that people around the world could have access to the science and secularism videos that Richard had made and put on YouTube was what uh, we were getting them subtitled into other languages. So that also is, is advancing the cause beyond the jurisdictional borders of the US and the English speaking world. It's really incredible uh, the, the array of work that is being accomplished at CFI and, and the Richard Dawkins Foundation, which I will talk about a little more in, in, in a minute. But I wanted just to finish up the resume that you opened up with, because we kind of landed ourselves in Utah, and I think that might have been where we stopped. So after I was the uh, director of the ACLU of Utah for a couple of years, I then transitioned to Florida, and I became the director of the executive director of the ACLU of Florida. I did that. Was, was that at that point was it still a Peace Corps job? Actually, it was it, it was a very interesting place to land and do civil liberties work. I used to say that you know the north of Florida was the Deep South, and the south of Florida was Central America, and you know you sort of had everything else in Nothing between. Nothing, yeah. Nothing, you know, you had. Uh, I used to joke that Pensacola, which was the, uh, the panhandle of Florida, mm -hmm. was the only place in America where having a major military installation was a liberalizing influence. <laughs> So you would get a lot of church state type cases up in northern Florida and then um, you would get some free, interesting free speech cases and religious freedom cases in South Florida. It was a fascinating place to do civil liberties work. So I did that for a number of years and then um, started writing op-ed pieces. I was invited by the St. Petersburg Times newspaper, which was the largest circulation newspaper in Florida. Many people don't think the Miami Herald is, but no, in fact, it was the St. Petersburg Times, to do op-ed pieces while I was still ACLU director. And um, within a few years of doing that, uh, picked up by Scripps Howard News Service, uh, I, I decided that was what I would, would do full time. So I moved, my husband and I moved to St. Petersburg, Florida. He was a sports writer and was taking on as a sports writer for that newspaper and I became a columnist and editor. Now that's writer. when you came into my radar because you received an award from the Freedom From Religion Foundation uh, for yes. your for your pieces in the newspapers. So what I happened? Think, yeah, that was that was it. Yes, okay. um, they didn't. They weren't giving me an award for the church state work I did with the ACLU. It was no. because in 2004, and I looked it up recently. It was about a week before the publication of Sam Harris's book, The End of Faith. So a week before the launch of New Atheism. I wrote a column for the St. Petersburg Times entitled, I'm an Atheist, So What? And I was provoked to do so because an atheist was giving the invocation at the Tampa City Council meeting. And rather than listen to this invocation, which turned out to be incredibly anodyne and just a, just a milk toast, you know, separation of church and state invocation, two members of the Tampa City Council uh, left in protest. And sadly, it was um, a Hispanic member and a black member who felt they could not countenance <laughs> listening. Now you know, why, now you know exactly. why Hispanic American free thinkers exist. <laughs> they could not countenance listening to an atheist give the invocation. Yeah. Uh, in fact, oddly, um, the, the African American City Council member, when being asked about it, by the media said that he listening to an atheist was like 
having unprotected sex, which I didn't quite understand that. I don't know. That sounds corollary. Unprotected sex could be a lot of fun, <laughs> <laughs> especially if you're dealing with your spouse. <laughs> That's funny because you know, I think both you with Spanish American free thinkers and Mandisa Thomas with Black Nonbelievers. Part of the reason you started those organizations were people in those communities think they are the only atheist out there because it is, it is so hard to come out as an atheist in those. Yeah. Um, how, how do you think that we're getting? much closer to the point where politicians can say, I'm an atheist, so what? Or are we still a generation away? You know, it was very sad what happened with Bernie Sanders and the Democratic National Committee emails. You saw um, that Step an back official... Step my opinion. Yeah, an official with the DNC had been brainstorming dirty tricks uh, to defeat Bernie Sanders in the primaries. And one of the ideas that he happened upon was to suggest that Bernie Sanders was an atheist. He thought that would really play well in, in West Virginia uh, to, to defeat him, to provide hurdles to his uh, victory. And it goes to show you that the anti-atheist bias that still exists out there is very strong. It's particularly um, poignant in in the political world, and I and I was sides. <laughs> I was hugely disappointed in the Democratic Party for not only contemplating this and mm -hmm. and not instantly denouncing the source of an idea like that, but the apology that was made was made to the DNC and to fellow Democrats. It wasn't made to atheists. Well, where was the statement put out by the DNC that said, um, we are appalled and disgusted by the attempt to exploit the unfair bias that exists against atheism in this country, and we proudly embrace the atheists who are Democrats. And we, uh, we, we know that atheists and agnostics have been the margin of victory in election after election in the United States, and we are, yeah. we are a rising population, we are a growing cohort, and we are a huge percentage of the Democratic Party. You know, 69% of atheists are lean Democrat or are Democratic. You, it's a slap. Yeah, I mean, we, we're essential to democratic success. Yeah. The non-religious now, of course, not all non-religious people are atheists or agnostic, but the non-religious are the largest voting bloc within the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. They're it, going to have to stop taking us for granted. Right, you feel completely taken for granted because you know we've joked about the GOP as God's own party for years, and they've been so wedded to the religious right. And so, the, so if you're a progressive or a Democrat, you're left with this decision, do I punish the Democrats for having done this stuff, or what do we get on the other hand, and how catastrophic is that? And, you don't um, like Cheetos? You know, no, <laughs> so, I mean, you really are left with a tough decision, because it matters what you do, it matters how you vote right now, um, but we do need to somehow get a stronger political arm so that this doesn't happen, you know, keep happening. So is the terrain getting better and easier for atheists? I think it is. You know, I, I do think that, uh, we, we're maybe 10 years away from the where, where lesbian gays are today, which is the, the big shrug. That's what we're aiming for, mm -hmm. the big shrug. Yeah. He's an atheist. Who cares? Yeah. Yeah. The big, yeah? And, you know? <laughs> but what do we borrow from their community, from, from their success in becoming mainstream? I think they showed us the way. Uh, it was incredible to see, in the course of 20 years, uh, a, a community that was really um, marginalized and discriminated against hugely, being widely accepted. It seems like a, a, after we went over the hump. Yes, uh, the tipping point. The there tipping was point, a definitely yeah. a tipping point. And it takes a lot of people working concertedly to get to that tipping point. That doesn't happen by accident. It doesn't happen by, um, by pure, pure natural progression. It happens through activism. It happens by people coming out. And, you know, look, atheists don't face the same discrimination that gays and lesbians once did. It's just not the same thing by orders of magnitude. So I don't want to conflate the two. But, and it's, but it's very easy for atheists to remain quiet about who they are, and as a result, uh, their friends, neighbors, coworkers, and loved ones don't know that they're a non-believer. So they, their friends and neighbors can harbor prejudice 
because they think they don't know someone who's well, a non-believer. They think they some, don't like someone who's. Some months ago, I was walking uh, my now defunct dog uh, down down uh, down the street in my neighborhood with my wife, and my wife had a T-shirt that said "atheist," and we this neighbor we've known for 15 years uh, stopped us and she says. Oh, you're an atheist? And my wife says, yes. And she says, but you're so nice. <laughs> and my wife said, you know how insulting you're being, right? <laughs> that you're not nice because you're an atheist, you know? And it took that the, the behavior, her behavior was kind of weird for a while. It's now starting to normalize. But for a while, it's like she, you could tell she felt uncomfortable being next to us uh, because we were atheists. But yeah, you're right. It's you, you uh, by that act, uh, educated your neighbor. And there, there may be a multiplier effect to it that you can't even predict. But that's exactly what we're talking about. Um, one of the premier projects of the Richard Dawkins Foundation is the Openly Secular Campaign. And that's basically a sophisticated nationwide public awareness, public relations campaign to get nonbelievers to be much more open about who they are. We, we've done it with uh, videos that individuals make and post themselves, uh, talking about their story, how they came to their non-belief, what it's like being a non-believer, if they're open or not, if they faced any discrimination as a result of it. Now this word secular was not an accident, it was It was not an ac they accident. They didn't just want to say openly atheist. Well, so, at the beginning of the campaign, um, a public relations firm was hired to do focus group testing and poll taking on various names for the campaign. Mm -hmm. The focus group testing was, fo was directed toward uh, the people who would have natural inclination toward accepting atheists and non-believers. So people who self-described as non-believers, people who also tended to lean more progressive, meaning more tolerant in general, people who cared about church-state separation, even if they may, may have been a believer themselves. And we asked uh, them a whole series of questions about different words, words like atheist, agnostic, humanist, free thinker, bright, you know, every possible label that the non-believing community imposes on itself. And it turned out that the two things, the two words that uh, th this community understood the meaning of were atheist and secular. And atheist, even in that group, didn't pull so well. There was a lot of pushback on the term. It's, you know, it's generally a pejorative, toxic term in the general public, which is outrageous. I, I, I and wonder how it got and we, all, we, will, <laughs> we were fighting against it. Yeah. But you know, this campaign is, is about social equity. It's about reducing the social stigma for, for non-believers. And so uh, we thought it would be a nice sort of, it, the training wheels, if you will, mm -hmm. of getting people to be much more open about their non-belief was for them to be able to call themselves secular. And secular is this umbrella term. Now we have the Secular Student Alliance. We have the Secular Coalition for America. We've been using that term as interchangeable with, with non-believer mm -hmm. for quite a long I time mean, I now. think it also implies the separation of church and And definitely implies that. And it allows for groups that call themselves humanists for groups that call themselves atheist, all to fit together under one big tent. So openly secular was scientifically arrived at, if you will. <laughs> so, yeah, so the, the older George Bush, the good one, the kind, smart one, you know, said that, yeah, I'm not sure if atheists should be citizens. Can, can you talk about sort of the purposeful conflation of atheist with immoral and unpatriotic and how that came about and how that also wasn't an accident? It seems to me that uh, the term atheist has been conflated with communist for a very long time. In the 50s at least. At least. I, the, the red menace uh, is, was a scary thing for a lot of Americans. You know, maybe most of your audience may be too young to remember duck and cover, but uh, kids uh, who, who today are in their 50s and up had to 
scrounge un under their desk or go into a ha hallway because you know a nuclear attack was underway. That and was this another, was somehow scientifically gonna, uh, this was somehow going to keep them safe. You know that desk that was that was. And who was going to attack them? And the, it was the Soviet Union that was going to be attacking America. And what was the Soviet Union but a godless nation, godless communist nation? So. Yeah, the politics of the U.S., particularly the right-wing politics, uh, conflated atheism with, with Soviet aggression, and it stuck. So I, I really think that we are still reaping the, um, the, the consequences of that campaign. It's like it's embedded in people's brains. And then on top of that, uh, people wrongly think that their morality and their ethics and their, their, the their empathy held, right? come from religion, which of course they don't. It doesn't. Anyone who's read the Bible knows that your morals don't come from that book. Yeah. If they did, we'd have slavery, we'd have um, <laughs> incest, we'd have a, a lot of very ugly things happen. I mean, we, we have them in throughout the world, but the point is that the... the They'd be promoting it, yeah. Yeah, the morality is not, is not from those yeah. lessons. Morality comes from within. The human animal is born to be more moral. We are an empathetic species. So maybe if we can jump now. So I had the opportunity to speak with Bertha Vasquez just a few days ago about the ties program that she does. You know, so can you tell us a little about that program and you know, why you're excited to support it? And oh, I would love to. Uh, it, this is the most exciting program I, the Richard Dawkins Foundation has. It's TIES stands for the Teacher Institute for Evolutionary Science. The Teacher Institute for Evolutionary Science. And what this does is teaches middle school science teachers how to teach evolution. Why is this important? Because 43% of Americans, when polled, say that human beings arrived on this earth fully formed within the last 10,000 years. The, the rate of scientific illiteracy in America is jaw-dropping, and in particular, those who question human evolution is a phenomenal, a phenomenal number, and it's embarrassing. It also has implications for public policy. I mean, we know that if, you, if you're making the rules and you don't subscribe to human evolution, uh, you probably aren't going to be promoting stem cell research. You're probably not going to be promoting evolution to be taught in schools. Climate change. You're going to I mean, deny climate change. Stuff, yeah. No, evidence-based uh, public policy is not a concern of yours, and it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. So we Espe want Especially when those people that feel and, and believe those things then get assigned in committees that are doing science funding, and, right. and, and now they, they control the, the purse of what research gets done and what research doesn't, doesn't get done, and we as a country start falling behind the rest of the, the, the world who's not as tied to religion as we are here. And just to go back to my earlier point, if open atheists and open secular people can't get elected, we're precluded from the public policy table, which means a huge cohort of literally millions of people don't have the possibility of elective office. They're leaving only either religious people, truly religious people, or hypocrites, people who are not religious but don't say that out loud or pretend to be because they want to be elected. So let's go back to ties. <laughs> teaching middle school science teachers how to teach evolution. Middle school teachers typically don't come to their profession with science backgrounds, but they're expected to teach science. They often come with elementary education degrees. They're afraid to teach evolution. Many science teachers in the middle school want to teach evolution, but either they don't have the depth of knowledge to do so, or they are worried about the pushback from administrators, from parents, even from the students themselves. I mean, Bertha Vasquez, who's an award-winning middle school science teacher in Miami-Dade County in Florida, she said in the last school year, one of her one of her young charges, one she was teaching evolution, turned his face to the wall and refused to listen because his parents told him that this was untrue and that it was. Um, Evil damaging evil information. 
and that's what this is. This is Miami Dade <laughs> County, you know. This is this is not the deep south or Mississippi, or, Alabama, well, Louisiana. I'd, I'd say in Richmond, once I became more activist last year, you know, I asked on the the teacher day, or whatever it was, like, you know, do you guys teach evolution? How do you do that? And her response was, well, how do you want that done? And they were so politically careful, and it was, you know, I think the superintendent is very pro-science, but you could see that the teachers are really caught in a bad place between maybe not knowing enough and the political uh, charge topic. So this program has developed professional development workshops that's put on around the country. And we're talking around the country. I mean, North Carolina, Arkansas, Texas, place even the panhandle of, of Florida. Uh, workshops around the country by Bertha and also members of the Ties Teacher Corps. These are volunteers, they're science teachers, they're biology professors, uh, they're scientists who will give an all day evolution workshop to middle school science teachers. Every, almost every school district in the country, if not everyone, has their teachers go through professional development training and often they can choose their own uh, program that they, that they were interested in. So making sure that a, a workshop on evolution is available to them is a, I think a real boon in that in science education for teachers and of course once you teach the teachers you're ensuring that generations of students will receive this information so not only is, is uh, professional development training on the ground, you know, face to face available through TIES, but on the website of the Richard Dawkins Foundation.net, there's a TIES page with incredible resources for teachers and for anyone else for that matter. It's all completely free, as are the, the development trainings. Uh, it's all underwritten by the Richard Dawkins Foundation. Um, and Teachers get lesson plans. They get labs. They get uh, they get tests. They you know whatever they want. Basically, videos, informational uh, questionnaires to to effectively teach science so that, so that it's a turnkey kind right. of operation. But I saw a PowerPoint actually give the lecture, and then they have three workshop things that you can link through, and you just see how enthused they are as they're teaching. So it's really exciting. Well. Uh, the problem that we have here in the show is that time just runs and runs away before we know it. It's, you know, so we have about seven minutes left and I wanted to, there's a question that I wanted to ask you because it's important to, to me and to a, a lot of folks on, on a more personal label, level, level is uh, we've heard that the, the secular community for the longest time uh, has been accused uh, of being uh, white all men. And so having you at the helm of two extremely you know, respectable large organizations is a big step in, in that direction in, 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 in sort of changing things and, and you know, making sure that, uh, that the status quo doesn't you know, become more appealing for, for others and certainly serving you serve as, a, as an example and role model for, for young girls uh, you know, leading this organization. So my question is, I've had in the past as president of Hispanic American Free Thinkers sometimes a hard time working Working with the larger organizations, uh, don't know what the reasons are. If, if you know, maybe we're just too small or whatever. But wanted to see uh, uh, what, uh, from your eyes, are there any plans or any uh, uh, future plans to work with uh, uh, the, the black non-believers, with Hispanic American free thinkers, or with other minority groups? Considering that, uh, for instance, in the United States, Hispanics make up 17% uh, of the population. Uh, 56 million Hispanics uh, live here, and it's a growing population. And so it's a population that we certainly don't want to ignore. African Americans are 13% of the population, the second largest group. And so it seems to me that it's kind of important that we also concentrate on these minority groups who are going to be giving us either uh, placebos or, or you know, homeopathy when we're old <laughs> or uh, you know, science-based, uh, evidence-based medicine. So, Oh, well, there's no doubt about it that, that the secular movement has to diversify or it's going to wither. Uh, this, and it, it wants to. I mean, I, I don't know anyone within the secular movement who wouldn't say that diversity would, would benefit the overall community. Um, and it's important to have people like you, David, who are out there representing uh, Hispanic atheists and non-believers so that there questioning and doubting Hispanics feel like there's a community that reflects 
who they are. Uh, and, and I can see the Center for Inquiry partnering with you and with organizations like yours uh, into the future, no doubt about it. Uh, I know that, you know, look, you know, uh, Debbie Goddard, who's uh, the head of outreach at the Center for Inquiry, she's also head of uh, African American Humanists and runs um, that organization. We, we are trying to shine a spotlight on communities that maybe hadn't gotten enough attention. And the thing is that the secular movement is, um, it represents a lot of people, but there aren't that many activists. Mm -hmm. we, and so and we there, should be, there should be no yeah. barriers. Yes. Everyone is welcome. And the water's great, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> right, so we're down to just a few minutes. I did want to ask uh, CFI does some wonderful advocacy. Um, when Charlie Hebdo happened a few years ago, very few people were willing to dive in and take a really firm stand. Um, CFI seems that they uniquely really did. Can you? I think. Just... Uh, well, you know, I wasn't with the organization at the time, but um, the, the CFI published the um, Muhammad. I mean, it, it published some of the cartoons of the earlier uh, controversy, and uh, it's been um, you know vocally standing up against. Islamic radicalism and willing to say that out loud. Uh, you know, there's a lot of political correctness uh, tiptoeing around some of the terrorism that has occurred, trying not to uh, paint everyone within Islam with the same brush, and I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. But, you know, you have to also be clear-eyed about yeah. what's going on, that this is religiously grounded and motivated violence. Yeah, well, so I was at a talk at um, George Washington University that Richard Dawkins gave, uh, maybe it was two years ago now, and we were doing some interviews after, and one of the comments was from, I think, a young Muslim couple criticizing Richard as if he, as if he were painting all Muslims with the same brush stroke. And it doesn't seem to matter how nuanced, you know, they, they give a clear argument with Richard and Sam Harris, Peter Boghossian, um, Sarah Muhammad from Ex-Muslim North America. They're very clear. We're not saying, you know, there is real bigotry against Muslims. So, so how do you navigate that thing where you have sort of like a regressive left that doesn't want to see the actual what's happening and they, they paint real bigots in the same brush as they paint, you know, Dawkins and Harris and all those guys? It's not the same. It's, it's simply not, you're not attacking every Muslim when you make legitimate uh, criticisms of the Muslim faith. When you say that women are, are treated as second-class citizens, to put it mildly, in most Islamic countries, it's a fact. <laughs> you're, you're just, you're expressing concern over a, a religious and cultural norm that is unacceptable for Western democracies and democracies that embrace Enlightenment principles. So even with their own, with their own secular communities, uh, I see people that are will think not one second making a nun joke or a Jesus joke or anything like that. But if it's a Muhammad joke or a Muslim joke, oh, uh, let me think about it. Let me make sure that you know. And so it, it, the problem that I see fairly let often is that let me look over my shoulder. That's, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's self censoring. You know, the self censorship is worse in my opinion because then people are afraid, and you see that in the media. They're afraid of saying things, of questioning ideas because they're going to be said, oh, well, Islamophobia, you know, just throw in the word and now you're, it's like somebody calls you a child rapist, you know, it's, it's much tougher to walk out of that and, 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 and prove that you're not that child rapist, you know, it's, it's, it's a stigma already when someone gives that. We have 30 seconds. <laughs> Is there any last thing that CFI has coming up that you want to tell us about any event or program? Well, well interesting that you should mention the, the different communities because there's also a Women in Secularism conference that's happening at the end of September in Arlington. Um, people like Wendy Kaminer will be there, Rebecca Goldsmith, um, I'm sorry, Re Rebecca Goldstein, who's married to Steven Pinker, and she ha is a remarkable academic in her own right. Um, this is organized by Debbie Goddard, and it should be a, a fascinating exploration of the female side of the secular community. Right. Well, with that, I think we're exactly out of time. Thank you so much for joining us. It was okay. a pleasure. Was and good luck. Great having host. you here. It was great being here. Thanks, guys. Thank you.